Okay, now you should be able to hear me and me alone. And as I said, today we're starting a new journey, a journey that is uh, aimed at going over the uh, very, very big, you know, it's a large goal, it's a big um, chunk of history, the history of the Hebrew. Uh, it's really a quite ambitious endeavor. And I hope it works out nicely. Uh, I'm sure some of it will be uh, at least nice and interesting. And I hope all of it will be. So uh, let's start with the history of the Hebrew language. Part one, uh, let's share it on screen. And yep, okay. So the history of the Hebrew language, part one. And uh, as you can see on screen, I took uh, a bit of uh, um, this historical uh, elements from the, the top right hand side is the, mm, what's considered to be the earliest Hebrew inscription that was found from Chirbet Kayafa. Okay. And, oh, well, he said, thanks, happy to be here. Don't be shy, we, we are all friends here. So uh, shy is, you know, that's not the policy being shy here. Uh, and you're more than welcome if you have any insights, anything you wanted to add, feel free to unmute or to write in the chat, whatever works for you. Anyway, top right hand side, uh, what's considered to be, if I'm up to date nowadays, the earliest Hebrew, uh, while it's, we'll get to talk about that, you know, when do we start talking about Hebrew or Proto-Hebrew or Proto-Canaanite or whatnot, from Chirbet Kayafa, maybe the time of King David, King Saul, possibly, um, on the top right hand side. In the middle, you should already identify what we have in the middle because we've seen it several times and it's nice to meet old friends again. This is the beginning of the book of Joshua in which manuscript of the Hebrew Bible? Let's see if you can tell, guys. Oh, don't be, you're muted. Aleppo? Yeah, the Aleppo Codex. Yeah, very good. Yeah, you see, uh, we, we get to meet old friends again. And on the bottom left, you can see newspapers from Israel, Israeli, modern Israeli newspapers. Haaretz, Yediot Acharonot, Ma'ariv, Yisrael Hayom. All of these are modern, um, modern Israeli newspaper. And I wanted to have kind of a collection of over the ages. If, if we're talking about 3,000 years ago, then uh, a text that was about 1,000 years ago, but really reflects some of the traditions of, let's say, a very long period before that, and modern Hebrew. Uh, with those differences and connections, uh, which we'll see over time, what continues what, and what is different, and how it is different, and how the Hebrew evolved throughout the ages, so I thought these would be kind of three pictures that I wanted to put as kind of a cover for this discussion. And before we talk about the Hebrew, <clears throat> we have to talk a little bit about what comes before the Hebrew, because after all, it's a historical discussion, right? The history of the Hebrew. So we start with a period where there is no Hebrew yet, at least not in the sense that we would recognize as Hebrew. There's a big discussion about that, and, and that might be one of the discussions we'll have in the future, um, especially since it has also sometimes religious implications, because rabbinic Judaism has this, and many other uh, views, religious views, uh, talked about the Hebrew, yeah, we, yeah, Huber is asking, and I've mentioned it uh, yesterday, I think, that we're switching and we're starting, we're doing uh, history of the Hebrew language today and tomorrow we have our guest speaker that I've sent you about. Okay, so as I said, uh, there is a point before the Hebrew. Uh, this also has some religious 
uh, implications as some Jewish and not just Jewish views uh, discuss those linguistic questions in religious terms. What was the language that God spoke with Adam in the Garden of Eden? Okay, in, in the sense of these type of questions. Again, there are philosophic, uh, today, as a general observation, today in the today's world of linguistics, as opposed to if we were to ask this question 200 years ago, is really not the, the at least ling linguists have a little bit forsaken that discussion uh, and left it to philosophers rather or, or religious uh, thinkers rather than uh, linguists themselves. Uh, though an interesting, if we're already talking about this question, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that in greater detail. There is a Professor Luba Khalap in Israel. Uh, I find her views a little bit apologetic again um, but she is suggesting something that is not impossible that what we call Hebrew let's say what people called obviously what we call Hebrew is different than the Hebrew that was spoken uh, 3,000 years ago so when they thought about God speaking with Adam Hebrew they you know the Hebrew to which they were referring was something like a proto-Hebrew maybe even proto-Semitic but as I said it's uh, today it's less than a religious question, uh, I mean linguistic question, more like religious or philosophical question. And we, I'm sure you've heard the word Semitic family or families of languages and so forth and so on. So what brings us to this point of the discussion? Who says that there are families of languages? You know, how do we get to that point when we even talk about families of languages. So as with, <laughs> I, I told you, yeah, there's a joke among Semit, Semitic scholars uh, about what is the most important Semitic language. And obviously languages come to mind. Uh, Hebrew, okay, Arabic has a very large vocabulary. Uh, Babylonian and Assyrian were the language of empires and so forth. But the joke is that German is the most important Semitic language because all the scholarship or the important scholarship about uh, Semitic languages was written in German um, up to, let's say, somewhere in the 20th century. Today, English is more important. But if you want to read uh, scholarship from uh, previous generations, they all go back to uh, German. And here, no surprise, here we've got August. Schleicher. Uh, August Schleicher was a German linguist in the 19th century, and he he wrote he focused really on the Indo-European languages, and he was the first one to actually try and reconstruct Proto-Indo-European language. He actually wrote a story, a fable, short story, in what he reconstructed as Indo-European, Proto-Indo-European, the mother language for all of the Indo-European languages. And there are basically several ways to explain the similarities between languages, uh, talking about influences or talking about kind of genealogy of languages. And I think that for a good reason, genealogy of, of languages uh, prevails because it simply explains uh, better than uh, provides a better understanding and I think it's today not really in uh, discussion when I say today um, for the many many years now and he was the first one to systematically address this question though not so much about the Semitic languages. Now I talked about the fam the family, the Semitic family, but I was kind of mm, not being fully honest about it because the Semitic languages is not a family of languages. It's really a subfamily of languages. Uh, it's a kitten with five five uh, other kittens in the in that leader, 
um, of the Afro-Asiatic languages. If you've heard the, the term, um, the old term was hemato-Semitic languages. Uh, following the biblical description of the dispersal of nations in the table of nations uh, in what we call in Genesis 10, let's see the verse at the bottom, which reminds us the biblical aspect or the biblical kind of concept of different languages, different people after the, in the, in the, after the flood, okay, in the post-Diluvian era, so to speak, um, coming to different nations, to different places. Let's have someone read this. Don't be shy. Let's see your hand. Um, right. Let's have someone read. It's, a, it's not a long verse. Aki, would you read? Would you do us a favor and read the verse at the bottom? Okay. Go ahead. Ela mishpachot bene noach le todotam begoyehem. Bene ela nifredu a goyim paaretz achar hamabul. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So uh, the Noah had three sons. Okay, Shem, Ham, and Yefet, and the the seventy nations. This uh, typological number that is so important in uh, biblical literature and in post-biblical uh, Jewish uh, literature, not just Jewish. Okay, we've talked about the Septuagint. Okay, the Septuagint, the Septuaginta, the seventy, um, even though it's seventy-two and Professor Tov mentioned it, right? Uh, so we've talked, the Genesis 10 talks about these 70 different nations, okay? The sons, the grandsons, the great-grandsons uh, of Noah that composed the different nations and Hamato-Semitic or Afro-Asiatic um, languages composed of these uh, where you can see the, uh, Semitic family is one subfamily of the Afro-Asiatic languages. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, these different languages, Egyptian, Cushitic, Omatic, uh, Chadic, uh, Omatic, uh, and, Ber and Berber, okay? Though, I don't know, if you've ever, if you've ever heard um, uh, if you've ever heard uh, an Arabic, a Moroccan Arabic speaker, Roi, you're an expert on, on dialects of Arabic, right? Don't be shy. Come on, we need your expert opinion. Roi? Uh, not an expert. Okay, he's shy. So, yeah, but don't worry. Uh, we won't, you know, uh, <laughs> so Berber, okay, has much less, or at least uses much less, uh, right, yes, well, yeah, I actually did mean that. Moroccan Arabic, the dialect of Arabic that is spoken in Morocco, again, we, we say dialect, uh, but really we're talking about a uh, Deglossia, a situation in which every Arabic speaker is really a speaker of almost two languages, two different languages. The one is the standard Arabic, okay, uh, Fuscha, or, or the standard Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran, the Arabic that uh, you would see if, if you look at the news, okay, the, the main outlets. And then you have local dialects of the Arabic. The Arabic that is spoken by a Moroccan Arabic speaker and the Arabic that is spoken in, in um, the Arabian Peninsula and the Arabic in the Levant, in, in uh, Syria, Palestine. These, have, these are different dialects and it's really that every Arabic speaker speaks like two languages. It's like, uh, let me think of English examples. Mm certain words that you would use only under, uh, nobody would use them uh, in, in regular circumstances. So uh, you don't use the word parcel 
uh, you say that, okay? Uh, like so American and English. Right, a little bit like that, but these are, uh, mm -hmm. these are, think about American English and English English, but as if American English, English English, Australian English, they would all have like a one dialect in which they would speak for official purposes, for formal purposes, and then each of them would have their local dialect. So it, maybe French is in Canadian and Quebec. Maybe that's a an example. Uh, so, so these again are are local, um, maybe local with a mainland here, or a different relationship. But I'm talking about one dialect, official dialect that would be one standard Arabic that is spoken by the the informal circumstances by all Arabic speakers. Okay and one local dialect for each. And sometimes the deviation, the difference between the local dialects is so great that mutual intelligibility is not there, okay? They would have hard time understanding each other speaking the, the dialect, but they would understand each other when they're speaking the formal language. Like the standard known, a little bit today as modern standard Arabic, the standard language, with the Egyptian dialect having kind of a secondary standard place. So why am I mentioning that? The Berber language, the Berber language is uh, is not using vowels so much. So if you've heard a Moroccan Arabic speaker, a person speaking Moroccan Arabic, you might have heard uh, something that would be almost devoid of vowels. So in, in Hebrew, we say katavti, or in uh, standard Arabic, katabtu. Um, you would have, you would have uh, in uh, uh, Moroccan Arabic, ktubt, <laughs> something like that. No, no uh, vowels, and that's by the influence of the Berber, uh, which uses less vowels. So it affects uh, the Arabic, which is a Semitic language. But that's, again, I'm not going to focus on these other um, non-Semitic uh, languages in the family of the Hamato-Semitic languages. I want to focus on the Semitic languages. We have enough work within, within the Hebrew, so come on. Okay. So where do people speak um, uh, Semitic languages. So um, this, obviously, some of the languages here are not uh, contemporary, okay? But some, some of them you can see are uh, living, some of them extinct. We're talking mainly about the Arabian Peninsula, the uh, Syro-Palestine area, uh, Israel, obviously, modern day, the Arabic speaking world, okay? And um, the Horn of Africa and uh, that we can see here. Someone asked me before about Ethiopian, right? Uh, Hubel, you were asking? Yes. Um, can you can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I saw I saw a little bit of Ethiopia, and that's why I was wondering why it was connected to the same color in your oh, uh, last year. Ethiopian. First of all, Amharic, which is um, the language spoken in Ethiopia, is a Semitic language. It's the they spoke they spoke Tigrinya, I think. Oh, so Tigrinya and, uh, okay, there, there is Tigri and Tigrinya. Okay. Both of them are Semitic languages, but Amharic is even spoken by more people. Okay, because uh, we, have, we have some people in my uh, village uh, who are originally from Ethiopia. So, who came yeah, here. but so. the, the, co the more common language in Ethiopia is Amharic. Well, yes, some people speak Tigrinya and Tigri. Okay, but mm. these are all Semitic languages. Okay. Mm. Okay, mm. we'll talk about what does it mean to be part of this esteemed family, but these are all Semitic languages. Okay, 
Uh, Roy is mm -hmm. writing. Just a second, Tatiana. Roy is writing. Okay. There are 75 different languages in Ethiopia. Most are not Semitic, but some are. Amharic is the working language of the government. So uh, the main language is Amharic. I think that around 40 million people speak it, if, if I'm not gravely incorrect. And then, as, a, as you said, Tigrinya, Tigray are, are Semitic. There are other non-Semitic languages, obviously, spoken. Um, and there are quite a few. There is a serious, cl serious cluster of Semitic languages in that region, as you can see, which is close to the Arabian Peninsula. You just cross the, um, the Arabian or um, uh, Peninsula and you're in Arabia. Babel, Babel Mand, I am Suez, yeah. Um, the Suez uh, area, strides. Okay, now moving on to, not the Suez strides, Babel Mandab, yeah, well, maybe. Okay, now in the, in the ancient world, okay, we're talking about a uh, slightly different uh, picture that's uh, uh, not entirely different, but uh, we're focusing on these languages. Uh, this is roughly the time of Jesus, okay? About the first century of the Common Era, Semitic languages. Now, the extent of how much Hebrew was spoken, uh, guys, again, I, I should say, maybe I should add it as a caveat, to every, every slide here could be uh, a discussion and obviously there are different opinions and sometimes I decide, okay, that's not such an important uh, subject to mention all of these opinions. So uh, I just want to be clear that we're not going to do a PhD on every slide. Some, in some cases we are going to mention different opinions, uh, but I'm trying to give like the baseline uh, agreed conventions. Uh, Tatiana, yes, your question? Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, show, show again uh, uh, that slide where the uh, Hebrew text uh, uh, on this the one? Uh, this one you mean? Uh, up just I think we Genesis can... 10. Oh, Genesis 10, I didn't hear uh, well enough. Uh, this is uh, this verse from Genesis 10. Yes, but... yes, yes. I just uh, uh, wrote and just not, not finished. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. So that's, uh, that's the verse that we read from the Table of Nations, Genesis 10, um, read for us by Aki. Uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, specifically, this is verse 32 of Genesis 10, if you want to look it up later. Okay. So now, mm, how close are different languages? Interesting question. And how? what can we know <clears throat> about the relationship between different languages? Um, this is uh, Maurice. Swadesh. Okay, Swadesh was actually an American 20th century uh, linguist. He was somewhat controversial in his uh, opinions. Okay. Um, and he was um, focusing on comparative linguistic and historical linguistics, which would take us to our discussion about these proto-Semitics. Who were these people who spoke that proto-Semitic language and how we can learn anything about those people since they're not around, okay? And they didn't leave us our memoirs because they did not write anything, okay? Nah, he doesn't look like me. <laughs> anyway, so Maurice Swedish, what he did, he did a, he compiled a very interesting test, 
that is not limited to the Hebrew, okay? Uh, it's an excellent question to ask, what was the language spoken in Egypt in the time of Moses? And the answer is obviously Egyptian. <laughs> uh, now, yeah, Egyptian, but you're right to be asking, it's not a Semitic language, it's a Hamato-Semitic language. You remember the six kittens? So that's one of the kittens. Um, any, anyway, so Maurice Wadish compiled a list of 100 words, 100 basic words, okay, uh, words that, you know, everybody, uh, basic words, I, you, we, uh, one, two, long, short, woman, man, big, small, all these uh, basic bird, dog, hand, knee, ear, eye, you know, body parts, basic animals, independent pronouns, basic uh, verbs such as eat, drink, see, 100 words that are very basic, okay? What did he do with this list, okay? He used that list to kind of uh, set a benchmark for the similarity between different languages, okay? If, for instance, in, in uh, English, you say um, one, and in German, you say ein, okay? And you look at all of this list, you go throughout the list and you say, oh, there is a similarity between English and German. Oh, and Dutch is very similar as well, and so forth and so on. We have some, uh, now a, almost a quantitative or a quantitative uh, measurement for this similarity between the languages. He compiled, he compiled a list of 100 words. The, it's called Swedish list, uh, Swedish, not Swedish. He wasn't Swedish, he was American, but yeah. Uh, so this list helps us determine the similarities between languages, okay? And helps us and will help us down the road when we'll talk about it, determine the relationship and possibly even the involvement of those Semitic languages. However, I want to first talk about the Proto-Semitic people and how can we talk about them again? We don't know them. They didn't leave us anything, any leftovers. So how can we learn anything about the Proto-Semitic language and the Proto-Semitic people? Any ideas, guys? Um, do you look for a common root? Okay, do you look like, for like common roots? Yeah. Aramaic, Hebrew and Arabic, for instance, yeah, or, see or, where the overlap is. Or maybe 25 different uh, Semitic languages uh, and examine them, okay? Let's see which words do we find. So when we reconstruct anything, first of all, the only thing you can reconstruct is something you don't have, okay? So when we reconstruct the Proto-Semitic, we basically take the Semitic languages, and we try to compare them, and by using comparative Semitics, reconstruct the uh, theoretical, the hypothetical languages uh, that were that gave birth to these actual attested languages. When we come, when we do that for the Semitic languages, that could help us understand something about the place where these languages were spoken, the people who spoke them, and to an extent also the time where they were spoken, okay? Uh, you know when Proto-Semitic was uh, spoken? I don't, no, but I, I cannot give you a date, but I can give you a relative date. Um, the Proto-Semitic uh, was uh, and the Proto-Semitic people lived exactly five minutes before the Proto-Anti-Semitic people. So that's, that's, the, that's the, something I'm, I'm quite certain, but again, it's not an objective, it's a subjective, it's a relative, it's a relative uh, uh, dating system. Anyway, <laughs> okay, good thing you're used to my sense of humor. Okay, guys, sell it, anyone. Okay, and why am I offering salad? 
Okay. Um, now, basically, the uh, the reason I'm offering salad, okay, is because all of these words are words that were in the Proto-Semitic. Okay, it's not in my backyard. Okay, these are all words that existed in the Proto-Semitic. What can I learn from that? I can learn that Proto-Semitic was probably not spoken in Alaska. Okay. Uh, and, and I'm not just saying it as kind of a joke, but really that's the way, obviously, when you get into the nitty greedy of it, to, to uh, examine the place and the type of society that uh, has these vegetables, especially the climate in which you have these vegetables, by the way, it's not very different than the area where these languages are still spoken or were still spoken when, when they would later on become written languages, those Semitic languages. So these uh, languages, I just brought one example here on the right-hand side, and we'll get to consonant shifts and vowel shifts in the future, okay? Uh, but here you can see an example of the garlic. We have here garlic, uh, we have onions, we have cucumbers, uh, lettuce, leek. And you can see on the top right hand side, the Hebrew word and its hypothetical Proto-Semitic form uh, or the form in Proto-Semitic that would later on become uh, garlic in biblical Hebrew. So you can see thum, and shum, okay? So that's uh, uh, the example of the salad and the similar concept goes for the uh, fruits or fruit trees. As a matter of fact, uh, these are names of trees, but oftentimes in Hebrew and uh, possibly in, in other Semitic languages, you have the name of the fruit itself and the name of the tree is the same. So for instance, we have here the tamar, which is the date and the date tree, palm tree. Uh, we have here the, on the bottom right hand side, the shaked. Shaked, you might remember the uh, prophecy of Jeremiah. Makil shaked, ki shoked ani. Uh, why, you know, talking about God is asking Jeremiah, what do you see? And he says, I'm seeing a branch of, um, of an almond tree. Okay. And God says, because I am watchful over my word, or I'm um, basically, I, I'm going to implement what I, my plan, shoked ani, and possibly related to the blossoming of the almond tree, which is quite quick. Uh, but the point is, by the way, the, these word plays are also a characteristic of the Semitic languages. We have not talked about what makes Semitic languages Semitic languages yet, but you can see these fruit trees. And again, these don't grow in Alaska. These don't grow in, in certain parts of the world. So we know that these uh, belong in a certain climate, and that helps us zero in on the area which the Semitic language or the Proto-Semitic was spoken. And not just that, the vocabulary of the Proto-Semitic helps us um, also uh, identify other elements, again, all based on the comparison between different Semitic languages and reconstructing the, the vocabulary of the Proto-Semitic. So here we have a family of donkeys. Uh, father donkey, a mother donkey, and a young donkey. On the right hand side, on the top right hand side, as opposed to the donkeys, we have the horses. And the joke, the joke in the military was, uh, how did it go? Um, yeah, just like that, 
an NCO is like, is like, you know, <laughs> an officer and an NCO is like a horse and a donkey. <laughs> Never mind, that was uh, years ago. My point is to make here a comparison between the uh, Proto-Semitic and the Proto-Indo-European. Remember, um, you all speak indo your We are speaking a, an Indo-European language at the moment. We're speaking English. And most of you are native speakers of Indo-European languages, be that English, French, Dutch, German, um, whichever. I think almost everybody here, almost, right? The picture is Amish people, right? And, uh, and uh, I, I find this picture extremely ironic, right? Raphael, I know, me neither. Raphael is mentioning that he is not a native uh, Indo-European language speaker, neither am I. Uh, yeah, I'm a native Hebrew speaker, though some linguists claim that modern Hebrew is not a Semitic language. Uh, famous for that is, first of all, it's not a new claim. It was uh, claimed by uh, German, huh, uh, surprisingly German scholars about a hundred years ago, but it is, uh, this claim is mentioned today uh, by Professor Gilad Zuckerman very often, uh, which I enjoy. I enjoy him. He's a funny guy. He's got a good sense of humor. I use some of his jokes sometimes. But the overall claim that the Hebrew is not a Semitic language, that's uh, a little bit one bridge too far. Um, anyway, so on the bottom left-hand side, we've got the donkeys, which actually have very good representation in the Semitic, in the Proto-Semitic. We have a word for a male donkey, a female donkey, and a young donkey. Okay, that's, that's quite impressive. Okay, on the top right hand side, we have the horse and the wagon, or the buggy, uh, but whatever that is. Uh, the horse and the wagon were very important in the Proto-Indo-European, and actually what gave the Indo-European such an edge uh, to spread so vastly to uh, the places where they eventually did. Okay, they, they mastered horse riding uh, very early on and, and also um, other aspects in the wagon. And actually remember, we've talked about August Schleicher and the story that he wrote, uh, the fable that he wrote in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, he used the, the, the ship and the horse, okay? We don't have a proto-Semitic word for horse, um, at least we don't know enough, uh, so we don't know that we have it, okay? We probably don't have it. And probably they mastered horse riding and use of horse in a later period. That's a very interesting difference uh, between the, uh, the domestication of the horse in the proto -Indo reflected by the Proto-Indo-European language and thus reflecting uh, the practices of the Proto-Indo-European people as opposed to uh, donkeys for us. By the way, the, the very important, the great importance of donkeys is reflected in biblical literature as well. Uh, while today a donkey, both in Hebrew and in other Semitic languages, in Arabic as well, if you call someone Ahmar, uh, um, a donkey, it's not a blessing, right, Raphael? Right, it's it's an insult, okay? It means you're stupid, okay? Uh, you're doing something in a, not in a very wise way. While in the Bible, Jacob has no problem uh, blessing his son Issachar. Issachar is a donkey, a strong donkey, okay? Um, and when the brothers are so afraid when they go to Egypt, they say, oh, they're going to accuse us and make us slaves and take our donkeys, you know? So it shows you how important was the donkey. Um, and I find the top right-hand side picture ironic because that was the technological advancement of the Proto-Indo-European people that led them to such success. While today for the Amish people, again, there are different types of Amish and I'm not expected on this, um, Amish people are 
like limiting themselves to technology that is based on, on this horse and chariot. Uh, yes, Georgie, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, what about the wars, uh, war narratives between the Hittites and the Egyptians? I uh, read somewhere that there were chariots and horses, so that predates uh, almost... No, like, no, 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 no. We have to remember that at the moment we are discussing, maybe I should have framed it better, we're discussing a point of time where there was not anything written uh, okay, in okay. these languages. Thanks. It's uh, the Hittite, by the way, is uh, an Indo-European language. Okay, but again, it goes back to to a period where nothing is written yet. Okay, once we have written evidence, the whole picture changes. Okay, but thank you for your question. And that's a little bit how we can learn from uh, from the uh, the vocabulary that we have in later Semitic languages that is common between these languages, and then we can reconstruct the Proto-Semitic, and we can learn something about the Proto-Semitic people. Uh, yes, Jerry. Um, my question is, uh, is there any common crossover for the word camel? Uh, yeah, and the word camel is one, one of the examples that is mentioned. Okay. I, I obviously other, didn't bring everything. Um, yeah, the other, uh, the, the other yeah. one has, was there, was there any uh, crossover from a donkey to a mule? Like those that okay. were the Okay, very good. Mule. That's, that's, that's an excellent point. Okay, there is. There is the word for mule, but it doesn't mean that the horse was domesticated. The fact that there were horses um, roaming in this region is different than uh, being domesticated and being used for horse riding and for wagons. So there, there was a proto-Semitic word for mule, okay, uh, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't reflect necessarily a domestication of the horses and the use of the horses. So that's, it definitely wasn't a big thing. You know, I, I'm making the comparison to the donkey here having a name for the male, the female, the young, and so forth. Like the, the urban legend about the Inuit people having like gazillion words for snow. Um, okay, now moving on to, hmm, Oh, well, 45 minutes. Okay, we can do a little bit more. Okay. Um, th there is no proto, I mean, I stand corrected. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. Okay. Uh, there seems to be, okay. Um, yeah, the poor man of Nipu. Okay. Uh, and I see donkey, unlike donkey and mule, there doesn't seem to be a camel. The, the question about the domestication of the camel and when it was domesticated is also a question about, uh, for instance, Genesis 24 and a discussion concerning that. Okay, my mother had, uh, or still sometimes says that, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Everybody knows this uh, this uh, phrase, or it's very commonly used. Okay, and I, uh, a little bit like that, lies, damn lies, and statistici statisticians, okay? Here we have two statisticians, okay? Uh, Thomas Bayes and Andrei Andreevich Markov. Um, Thomas Bayes was an English mathematician and a statistician. He was also, uh, as, as you can see, he was a minister, okay? He's got the uniform for it to show. Uh, we're talking about the 1700s, okay? And he formulated, the math is a little bit behind my, uh, my math skills, 
Okay, after all, I'm a Hebrew teacher. But what he did, he kind of combined what we know with what we don't know in, in math and in statistics and enabled us to create kind of a combination of how to deal with statistics of events or that happened with stuff that didn't happen and combine the two and and we'll i'll explain how it reflects uh our discussion concerning the dating of the different semitic languages and the connection between the two um now markov on the right hand side here was a russian statistician or mathematician and what he did uh, he formulated he developed what's known as the Markov chain or the Markov process, where you have several events uh, that have a certain probability and one is following the other. So a chain of statistical events. Why is that important? Hmm. First of all, uh, because with today's computation, we are able to take these mathematic ideas, statistic ideas and again i had to read like 10 pages of this uh to really put me uh, up to date and and several more you know explanations of how it works and i know how bad it was for me so i'm really not going to do that for you guys okay but the uh the point is that it enables us to kind of go through um, statistical process of suggesting what was the relationship between the different Semitic languages and what came from what and what when did things uh, develop okay modern Egyptian Arabic is the standard Arabic for radio television and so forth in the Arabic speaking world I would say it's a uh, kind of a secondary standard there is the modern standard arabic and then egyptian arabic which is uh which is kind of not the uh it's second only to the standard uh it's a second standard but we could uh, elaborate on that i would guess in a much more you know with better knowledge of dialects of arabic um in any case so Computers, evolutionary biology, math, statistics, all help us create models and with high probability, take these models through the, the what we know happened based on archeological, you know, epigraphic findings and give us the best probabilities to understand how it happened, uh, what were the origins of it. If anyone is really interested in the math, I can send them the paper. It's, it's really, uh, I, I would say it's, it's professional statisticians, uh, statistics. So here is the bottom line of their opinion as far as the origin of the proto-Semitic. Uh, and we're, okay, I'll explain a little bit about the history of this question and then, okay um yeah very good so thank you Roy. uh disney movies are in uh i think that if you use it for disney movies that's the new standard okay but uh yeah msa modern standard arabic is the common standard egyptian is used for less formal environments such as disney movies um i don't know is there anything more formal than, than disney movies that's a different question so as far as the question, the, hist the history of this question, initially people, the, the scholars simply assumed that Hebrew starts, or I mean Semitic languages start in, um, in the Middle East. Why? Because, just because maybe the religious influence maybe was prejudiced towards uh, uh, Africa, maybe it was other reasons, but that, that was the assumption. At a certain point, actually, the, um, the main opinion actually shifted 
to viewing Africa and Ethiopia as the origin of Semitic languages because there were many languages there and or many dialects and many changes but today both based on the understanding that many of these languages are actually rooted in in one in one proto language and again remember guys we've talked about um the similarity between different languages so you might have several languages but if you can see that they all come from the same point then they don't have a uh, that that big of a benefit as far as understanding that many languages suggest the origin of that uh, language from there and based on the statistics as well as other claims they claim that the origin of the semitic languages or proto-semitic is as you can see not too far uh, that would be a and then b c um the origin of uh, afroasiatic as you can see is in africa but the point where the two divide uh is earlier than obviously even the proto-semitic the proto-semitic comes from this area that would be today uh the trans euphrates okay beyond somewhere between the land of aram possibly okay and then uh, we have branching out to the east to the west and so forth i love this because for me it goes back to uh the biblical verse of joshua 24 2 and 3 okay for me it echoed this verse but i think that will will end here and then i'll take uh, maybe one or two questions and we'll call it a day and we'll continue uh next time um any questions guys uh nathaniel yeah go ahead uh, i had posted the question in the chat uh, that is uh has this got any connection with the pelagic episode of the earth was divided uh, with Come what again? we have studied the uh, the division of the earth oh the 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 or, or we can say the continental yeah. drift theory something like oh. that I think that the the time frame is yes, very yes. different. I think at oh. least from a scientific standpoint I think the time frame for the division of the of uh, the continents is different than that of the languages. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Um and next one uh guys uh last question Rafael Go ahead. Rafael. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, your hand is up. Do you have a question? No, I want I want I want to just mention Hamara is in Mandaic, which has been donkey and right in in uh, in uh, various various yeah. dialects of aramaic yeah. arabic hebrew right yeah and uh, in in aramaic uh, syriac they use khmara uh, which is probably is, is the same it's just a different right. dialect correct um yeah. yes um that's the stage in which uh semitic um answering emmanuel the stage in which uh semitic languages arrived at africa okay guys uh queen of sheba she could understood solomon uh i uh mutual intelligibility is a different question i would guess that it depends wh which languages she knew solomon was a wise guy so uh he had thousand wives he could probably understand many languages yeah uh, i don't know Okay, Susanna, last but not least. I was thinking of Moses and also um Israel and Joseph, those characters that they all seem to have no difficulty in communicating with Canaanites, with Egyptians, with various individuals that it's possible that the accent might have been closer no. so that Uh, actually, actually, I would go the other way around. Actually, Joseph is mentioned 
as like outsmarting his brothers, having this translator for them not to know that he can understand them. Oh yeah. Which shows which shows that there was no mutual intelligibility uh, as a default. Okay. And the other question I have is a lot of biblical scholars look at Ugaritic and Akkadian. Okay. These and are they compare languages. that with Hebrew. And I okay. was sort of wondering why, because it branches off. Is it because they're looking for the Proto-Hebraic or a, pro a Proto-Semitic? Okay. First of all, they do that because that's what we have. And secondly, uh, secondly, um, many of these, in the case of Ugaritic, there are Okay, first of all, uh, it's a complicated question, and we'll definitely talk about Akkadian and Ugaritic in the future. Ugaritic represents the, the Canaanite world um, by its own testimony, even though the city of Ugarit is not really within Canaan, but a little bit to the north. It's in uh, Rasa Shamra in Syria, uh, but the, it does represent the Canaanite world. So it gives us the other side of the story in some aspects of, of at least how to relate to the Canaanite pantheon, which of which to read from the Bible is, is like reading about the history of, a, of the French people reading, uh, written by an Englishman. You know, uh, it's not, it's unfair. Uh, so that's interesting. And the Akkadian has many, many contributions. We'll get to different, different periods and how, you know, it contribute, contributes to a better understanding of Hebrew by looking at Akkadian. Uh, uh, Netanyahu, um, yeah. one thing that was common for all people besides, you know, growing things, it was trade and being able to get uh, produce to different places right. in exchange. Was there any commonality in trade or in uh finance measurements okay. weight silver gold that we can have well, some commonality you don't you and i don't have that commonality you i speak meters you speak feet i speak shekels you speak dollars i speak kilos you speak pounds so why would you go back to the ancient people and ask them to have that commonality no 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 your question is a very good question obviously it's more complicated than i can answer in on one foot or or, or one meter <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that I want to buy. I want to buy the cave of Macpila. How do I buy? It? Yeah, yeah. You want to? Okay. <laughs> I know a lawyer that can help you with that. Anyway, uh, so guys, we'll see you tomorrow for uh, our guest speaker, and we'll continue uh, with this hopefully next week. I enjoyed today. I hope you did as well. Yes, I did. It was very interesting. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank